Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our Global Transfer Pricing Industry webcast series today. Today's webcast will be on the industry insights and the impact of COVID-19 on the industrial products and construction <laughs> industry. The speakers of the webcast today are Claudia Lauten, a partner in Germany who is the global transfer pricing industry leader for the industrial and product construction industry, along with Tamina Sharma, also a transfer pricing partner from India, and Shantu Ghosh, a transfer pricing principal from the US, who are both members of the industrial products and construction industry network. We also have Britta Mittelfeld from Deloitte Consulting Germany with us, who is the leader of the Digital Factory and will be sharing some interesting views and insights from her perspective. We will start off the webcast with an introduction of the Global Industry Program led by Jobs Wilmans from Germany, who leads this initiative um, globally. Before I hand over to the presenters, um, please note that this session will be recorded and shared with you within the next few days. Um, enjoy the rest of the webcast and Jobst, over to you now. Thank you very much, Anodri. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Jobst Wilmans and I am heading respectively coordinating the Deloitte Transfer Pricing Global Industry Program. For your information, we started uh, with this initiative uh, two years ago. The objectives of the Global Industry Program are on one hand to link industry knowledge with transfer pricing expertise and on the other hand um, to be one step before tax authorities. As you know, tax authorities, especially competent authorities, are more and more organized in industries. As you can see on the right side of, on, of this slide, the Global Transfer Pricing Network is organized like a cube with three dimensions. First dimension is product and services, second dimension is regions, and the third one is industries. Our goal is to liaise all three dimensions with respect to the needs of the market. Now to go to the next slide. Here you can see our organizational setup. You can see um, that um, industrial products and construction belongs to the industry, energy resources and industrial products. Based on the fact that industrial products and constructions have specific characteristics, we have to decided to organize for today a separate webcast uh, for this sector. Claudia Lauten, Lauten is heading this sector and it is an honor now to hand over to her and she will give you an overview about um, the content and the agenda of our webcast of today. Thank you, Jobs. So welcome from my side as well. Uh, as Jobs mentioned, Claudia Lauten um, leading our industry um, of this industry subgroup from a global perspective. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and we, we start now. Um, we would like to start with a short introduction on the business because for a transfer pricing person, obviously, what the business does is key. Um, and start with a kind of link, what very high level does COVID-19 or has, has it done today to the business? To give you a flavor of that to be followed by looking at some more details what is really the impact on the industrial products and construction industry so what is happening um, in the field as a result of the crisis and as you can imagine we are not able to cover all the the transfer pricing implications and at the same time we wanted to make sure that what we present to you today is really relevant for the industry um, and not just reiterating on what you may have heard in other webcasts or in other events already. Uh, we picked three um, topics from what we what we say as, as main impacts in the industry and we'll elaborate on them in a bit more detail from a transfer pricing perspective. We welcome your questions. Um, to facilitate building them in 
during the um, the webcast, if um, if appropriate, um, we ask you to provide your question via email to um, the, the email address you can see on the slide now. So this will end up with Stefan Bock, uh, senior manager in our our German practice. Um, and depending on, on, on the nature of question, we'll either cover it as part of the webcast or we'll um, address as, as many as we can uh, at the end of uh, the webcast in a separate Q&A session. Um, so please do, um, do direct your questions to Stefan via email. Um, it will not be possible to uh, use the, the Skype chat, chat function that has been inactivated. Um, and one further comment, because in this uh, morning sessions, we have done the same webcast in the morning already, uh, morning uh, European time, obviously. Um, some participants have faced uh, some issues uh, regarding the screen and, and they couldn't see the slides. So if you can hear us, but not see the slides, and please, um, to drop Stefan a note and really make sure um, that uh, you, you get a PDF version of the slide deck so you can follow the slides as well and not just hear our, our voices. So with that in mind, uh, let's, let's get started. So why do we start with what's happening in the business? I, I briefly touched on it a minute ago, but um, as a transfer pricing person, obviously, you're dealing with tax, with compliance requirements, with um, tax rates and, and things like that. Um, but obviously, given it's transfer pricing, um, it's all about the business value chains and what is what is happening in the field that needs to be reflected then from a transfer pricing perspective. Um, so this is why we thought it would, it's worthwhile to start with the business. And at first, we would like to have a look at the macroeconomics. What you can see here, that is the global output. Um, it's just for the industry, uh, industrial products and, and, and uh, construction business. So, so very much focused to your industry. Um, and on purpose, we started in the year 2006. So you can say um, the manufacturing output has come down almost as much as during the, the crisis in 2008, 2009, which, which was quite uh, quite a, a, a huge crisis as well. Um, so it had almost come down as much as, as like 10 years ago. And the services business activity has come down even more. Um, it's, it's very clear, this is it's a global shock, it's unprecedented. And when we compare or continue comparing with the crisis in 2008-2009, this one, the, the old one was caused by economic parameters only and, and certainly had some, some other impacts or consequences then as well, but uh, the result was economic. Here, the, the cause is a, a pandemic crisis. So the economic is just one of the results. And other than for like 10 years ago, for the crisis 10 years ago, even though we already see a, a sort of a nice sharp uh, incline already in, in 2020 here on, on that picture, uh, we cannot expect it to go away as quickly as looking backwards now, the crisis 10 years ago has, has done. Um, so we have to expect it will stay on longer. Um, there will still be disruptions going forward. Um, and we have to, we have to adopt, the businesses will have to adopt and the transfer pricing board will have to adopt to that. Um, Britta will share with us now some insight on what is actually going on in the business and the industry. Uh, so what's really happening in the field as a result of COVID-19. Thank you, Claudia. So let's maybe start with how does our clients supply chain and operation, operations work today? Because I think uh, one main factor is that most supply chains actually became supply supply chain supply networks over the last years, and um, this actually led to a situation where COVID-19 um, worked as an accelerator for all the negative impacts that are happening on the different areas of the supply chain. So let's start at the demand side. Most of our clients actually experience. Um, 
a highly a sharp drop on the demand side. And those ones who don't experience a very, very high volatility. This leads to the situation that the current supply networks are not able to deliver to the customers anymore in a precise way as they used to before the crisis. This leads to that on the demand side, a higher safety stock needs to be prepared and that the supply chain has to work with higher costs. And those higher costs are actually a very difficult to handle factor today for most of our IPNC clients. On the supply side, we have another situation of instability that comes from a lot of, our, of, of the suppliers from our clients are right now in a situation where they are in a financial unstable situation or where they are having trouble of getting the right materials themselves on a global level. So the supply side is almost as unstable as the demand side. And the third factor is that within the operation, so basically within the four walls of our clients' factories, a lot of processes had to be adapted to new delivery schedules, to new availability of the workforce, and to authority regulations uh, uh, depending on how to, to set up production, etc. that a lot of our clients right now face certain quality and output issues that, again, accelerate the problems on the supply and demand side. So our clients are right now looking into different ways on how to solve this problem on the short and on the long term. And one of the key messages is that most of them want to improve the agility of their operations. They want to become more agile when it when they when when the demand of the supply situation changes and they work a lot of uh, a lot on digitalization within the different areas there in order to achieve that agility so we would like to make a small poll with you and see what are your current action when you deal with covid-19 in your own company Yes, yeah, so as an explanation, thank you, first of all, Britta, uh, as an explanation how to sort of vote, you just, um, just, just, oh, the first one already knew how to vote, um, just tick the respective um, answer on your screen and we'll immediately show the result. So what was the key strategy that you have adopted to cope with the challenges of COVID-19 crisis? Was it to start um, producing new product, products or was it to start looking for new suppliers? Um, did you reduce your number of personnel or redesign your financing? Did you establish new ways of marketing or selling? Or was it none of the uh, above? And, and you can only sort of tick tick one, uh, which you think is most relevant um, to your company. Um, we, we'll leave the poll a little longer open. And uh, while you still have the opportunity to, to poll, um, Britta, I have a question to you. You just... You just explained or gave us some insight on what's what's happening and how do uh, clients or customers react um, to the distortion and disruption caused by the crisis. So based on your experience, do we currently still mainly see short-term reactions to the crisis, so to deal with the immediate restrictions and limitations, or is there already quite some mid-term and long-term planning going on? I mean, so I think right now everyone is working on short-term solutions. So we have a lot of requests for like ramp-up support um, and of course for traditional cost-cutting projects, um, which I think is, is, is very standard in a situation like today. But we are starting discussions right now too on how um, especially digitalization projects um, can be started and how they would actually help to avoid a situation um, on the operation side like the one that uh, our customers uh, are facing today. So I would say there are 
some mid and long term projects starting. Most of them, at least the ones that I see, are within digital and uh, digital supply chain on a very broad spectrum. And the short term projects are mostly focusing on costs and ramp up. Okay, so I guess no surprise to most of us, and and of course you would expect still to see a variety of different um, replies depending on the individual situation of um, the company. Anyway, um, so looking at the poll, this is nicely spread <laughs> over the different options we provided. So obviously there is there can be quite quite many different answers and replies, and again this is a clear sign that it's not a one fits all situation and it very much depends on the individual facts and circumstances for each company group. So as, as promised, let us now have a closer look at some main consequences from a TP perspective. Thank you. So from a TP perspective, it's mainly two different aspects. If we, if we were to categorize what's happening and, it's, and what will impact um, the relevant parameters for transfer pricing, it's two big sort of blocks. One is that we see a, a new regulatory environment. The other one is that we have restrictions and issues on, on, the, on the current value chain. Um, to start on a new regulatory environment, that some of those measures by governments or governmental bodies, for example, they are quite short term. So, for example, all those plant plant closures we've we've seen um, that were um, that were sort of ordered by the government, um, and some the closure of borders. That is sort of more short, short term. It may not go away quickly, completely, but we can already see regarding, for example, closure of borders. We already say it's not as strict as it used to be a few weeks ago. Um, and again, it may still come back to some extent, um, but that's sort of more short term. Short term health and safety of employees, of course, there's a lot of and customers as well. There is a lot of uh, short term measures uh, too, and quite some of them will stay for a while, so be mid term and maybe even long term. Uh, and there is another aspect, um, which is on sort of on the other side, uh, that's incentive schemes. We've we've seen um, quite some countries already coming up with incent huge incentive schemes. Um, and we'll ex explore that in, in more detail in a minute. Uh, on the restrictions on the value chain, so that's not like the regulatory framework, that is more as a result of that, what ha already happens in the business and does impact our value chain. So that is planned closures, for example, from our suppliers, um, that's procurement issues we see as a result, there, some of them may even go bankrupt. Um, and we'll need to procure somewhere else. Uh, we may have shipping or delivery issues ourselves. Um, and, and overall, we, we have to, or we say in many cases that there is a drop in customer demand. And that might be short term, hopefully. Um, some of them may, may be mid term. And for sure, we have the business as well have to, to cope with it. So, with this in mind, we selected three topics to discuss in more detail the, the relevant transfer pricing implications. The first one, as already indicated, that's incentive schemes. Uh, we would like to provide you with some insight on what's going on in that respect and why is it important from a transfer pricing perspective. The second one is value chain adjustments, uh, in particular in relation with digitalization and the focus on IP. And the third one is cash and liquidity management. Um, given that this is, it, it may decide about survival or not in some of the fact patterns we see on the market right now. So to start with incentive schemes. Why do we talk about incentive schemes um, in a round of transfer pricing experts? Um, because we currently say um, incentive schemes on, on a scale 
um, that, that has an unprecedented magnitude. This will change the business, new markets will be targeted, and that's true for both sort of yourself as a market player, uh, and, and it may, may be true for your customers, and then of course you may want to follow to some extent. Um, manufacturing is in the focus for many of these schemes, um, so it will be one of the parameters that will have an impact on well, how the value change, in particular in the manufacturing industry, will look like going forward. Um, so just to give you a, a flavor of what the magnitude of such incentives, incentive schemes may look like, we will look at the example um, that India has, give us, has given us, because India has announced quite recently a huge scheme and um, Tamina will give us some more insight on what that exactly provides for. So thank you, Claudia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, wherever you are. Uh, just as uh, Claudia mentioned about uh, India, uh, you know, about India initiatives, uh, India has been indeed uh, very proactive in combating, you know, um, a related crisis. Uh, and in that uh, uh, part, um, you know, the government of India has announced uh, recently a special economic package to provide uh, the much needed uh, stimulus and relief to uh, you know, various sectors. Uh, the intention is to propel uh, India towards uh, you know, self-reliance. The economic package uh, was announced, uh, which amounting to INR uh, you know, 20 uh, trillion, uh, sounds big, uh, which is equivalent to 200, 267 billion US dollar and amounting to 10 percentage of India's GDP. Uh, this is the first time in history of India such a large package was announced and uh, this package was announced in consequently in five days, uh, you know, where the finance minister of India actually presented this package. So you can understand how big this package is and what kind of various, uh, you know, the, the aspect which is for each part and every part of uh, India uh, is concerned about. Uh, the uh, particularly uh, that includes uh, not only transferring you know the the credit in the bank account of uh, poor, but also relaxing amending administrative and legislative norms, uh, providing subsidized loans to industry and businesses, uh, also some loan moratorium period, uh, easing out a monetary uh, uh, policy and liquidity to ensure that smooth capital flow uh, actually uh, happens within the you know the businesses the stimulus package actually revolves around the five uh, you know the pillars uh, to lay down the foundation of uh, uh, you know new self reliant india the, the first, the foremost, is relating to boosting and exploiting domestic demand. Uh, as uh, India, India, Indian market is very big, works out to almost about 1.35 billion, um, uh, you know, the population. Uh, second part is utilizing uh, the economy's vibrant and young demography. Uh, the third one relates to, you know, the technology-driven uh, initiatives uh, towards, you know, a lot of digitization initiative. Uh, the fourth one relates to, you know, developing, uh, you know, state of art infrastructure. And the last one, which is a major one, uh, which relates to structural changes in land and labor laws, which were much more needed, uh, you know, for such a quite long time. Uh, as we all know, India is the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, and if we have to say the where the chief contribution comes from, the 50 percentage of GDP comes from the service sector. No doubt, uh, the manufacturing and industrial, uh, you know, uh, uh, shows a amount of uh, growth, but the growth is little lesser than the service sectors. Uh, in this package, uh, you know, the India has opened up uh, with a lot, uh, you know, a lot of historical uh, uh, sectors which were initially been closed. Uh, like mining and defense, which is now open up uh, for the private and foreign investors. The intention uh, over here is to, you know, reduce the significant imports, increase indigenous manufacturing and create a lot of jobs. Some of the key uh, industrial sector that will also benefit from this, uh, you know, the economic announcement are electronics, mining, defense, aviation, 
power, renewable, and infrastructure. Further, uh, there are certain, uh, you know, the announcement related to, uh, you know, the compliances, uh, you know, the deferral uh, in terms of timeline, as well as, you know, the some of the, the withholding tax rates being also been reduced to provide, uh, you know, the, the cash management uh, techniques to the, you know, a lot of taxpayers. Uh, uh, now, if we have to look at uh, very specific benefits, uh, which is relating to manufacturing, uh, which deals into, you know, the, the, the theme which India is, uh, uh, you know, going go about and started, uh, you know, their flagship program, you know, Made in India concept. Uh, in that, uh, uh, you know, this program was started in 2014 and gradually there were a lot of announcements being made uh, to, uh, towards, you know, showing the commitment towards these initiatives. So those commitments uh, actually relates to providing, um, you know, the, um, uh, in terms of uh, various benefits. The first, the foremost, it relates to uh, in terms of a uh, lower corporate tax rates, which uh, for the, you know, the, for the manufacturing, a uh, new manufacturing uh, unit can avail 17.16, uh, you know, precisely the percentage as a corporate tax rate which is very competitive if we have to compare with uh, uh, other Asian countries like China, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Further to boost employment, you know, there is a specific 30%, uh, you know, the allowances being given, which is, um, uh, you know, about the, you know, the, the salary cost of the, the people who works in this manufacturing sector. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, some of the, you know, the duties uh, related to import uh, and uh, uh, export, there are some of the, you know, the, the deferral uh, mechanism been also uh, introduced as well as the exemption mechanism been also introduced, uh, which is basically uh, related to, you know, capital goods and raw materials. The Made in India uh, products maybe now uh, offers better pricing to the group as, you know, uh, if you import uh, the completely finished goods, it may, you know, lead to higher custom duties. So, for example, um, the medical equipment, if you import and sell in Indian market, uh, the custom duty is, uh, is almost close to 12 and half percentage. But you import, uh, you know, the, the, the parts uh, related to medical equipment and do the manufacturing in India, the parts only, uh, you know, attracts 2.5 percentage of, um, you know, the custom duty. So with that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know, there are a lot of benefits which attach to the indirect taxes. Along with that, if you export uh, from India, there is a zero uh, export duties. Uh, further, India has a robust uh, dispute uh, resolution mechanism um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, direct taxes. AP, especially for the transfer pricing and MAP uh, mutual agreement procedures are very favorable and popular. Uh, for indirect taxes, uh, there is a mechanism of advanced ruling, which is also available. Uh, in terms of uh, APA, uh, it is, as I said, it's so popular because many uh, MNCs have availed uh, this uh, APA and got a favorable uh, outcome from the APA authority, which is uh, uh, sounds very reasonable from the, you know, the tax perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, if any, uh, you know, the taxpayer who is looking for a, set, a setting up man manufacturing, uh, the, you know, activities in India can also avail the APA either, uh, you know, uh, uh, bilateral or unilateral. Uh, apart from this tax incentives, Government of India has also introduced fiscal and non-fiscal in, uh, incentives uh, to, you know, uh, to welcome new uh, investments uh, from, you know, the lot of uh, foreign investors. Some of these incentives are uh, subsidies, uh, which is linked to employment generation, electricity and water charges concessions, exemption from the stamp duty, and others uh, related, uh, you know, the fees, uh, so on. The government has also, uh, you know, to promote ease of uh, doing business theme in India, also uh, provided, uh, you know, the, the other benefit uh, attached to the manufacturing, uh, which is, you know, the offering land at the concession rates, which, which is uh, in the past uh, was a, a larger big issue. Uh, also, the b better rail and road connectivity, uh, uninterrupted power and water supply, 
um, further a dedicated port facility uh, where you know the uh, uh, for export and import can happen setting up of uh, even a website uh, for a faster clearance and providing all the information related to various incentives been also put in place additionally uh, besides the central uh, government uh, there are the various states have come up with the various incentive schemes and those schemes also provides uh, uh, beyond this uh, central uh, schemes some of the state specific benefits also and uh, this are this the uh, schemes are more related to uh, you know the certain conditions and uh, the you know the area where this manufacturing uh, can happen uh for six, uh, uh, example scz is also there in some of the states which offers uh, uh, many benefits uh, related to duty free uh, import as well as uh, domestic pro uh, you know the domestic procurement also uh, where the tax holiday has been provided uh, with this i will conclude my overview on the benefit uh, which is available to ipc sector and in terms of a product which is made in india So back to you, Claudia. Thank you, Tamina, for giving us what what I would think is really a truly impressive package um, that the Indian authorities have or government has 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 introduced. Um, I think this gives us a, a really good flavor that this is not like the regular incentive scheme package we see now and then in for many countries to attract investors to attract taxpayers. this is is beyond that this is about attracting man, manufacturing in particular because the underlying rationale is um is being self reliant so not not have to rely or be dependent on other countries um because obviously some countries notice that this may bring you in a very difficult situation in um circumstances like the covid-19 crisis um has produced so it's and this is why it's it's mainly amongst us mainly um, directed towards manufacturing to be attracted and as as i said previously we do see some other countries at least considering so planning to uh, introduce something similar it won't just be in the end the end and and we've already seen quite some a few plans for from other countries as well so it's definitely worthwhile to look out for that the business will certainly look out for that as well um and this will have an impact on how going forward mid term and long term your value chains the value chains of your of your group uh, may change it's it's just one parameter but potentially not um, the smallest one so what then is um what do we have to consider from a transfer pricing perspective if something like that happens so we say uh, building new manufacturing activities uh, being built up in a, in a country like india or existing ones be extended um this typically has an impact on the the, the current manufacturing activity so we may say a reduction um in the current activities and maybe even plant closures as a result wouldn't be the first time in many cases and that we've seen that when um there is so many so so many good reasons to manufacture abroad um so that may lead to some kind of transfer of function in in some countries i mean the ocd business restructuring recommendations um of course will will apply for many uh, countries around the globe uh, and and we know that some countries have quite sort of strict and and potentially even exceptional interpretations of those rules and and have implemented respective own uh, domestic rules um so whenever we in particular when we reduce local manufacturing to go abroad um there's typically some kind of ip involved as well and and many countries take that as a basis for um some kind of taxation so if that happens it's certainly worth while to have a closer look uh, depending on the exact nature of the change depending on the countries involved um could it result in exit taxation and if it cannot be avoided uh, what what would be a robust um compensation to reflect um and sort of absorb um the relevant rules to align what's happening on both sides of the transaction so if we if we do have if we can't avoid um taxable income on one side that we make sure we have at least 
uh, the respective um, taxable or tax deduction on the other side, uh, because otherwise, obviously, we do have double taxation. And talking about double taxation, um, it may have an impact on existing APAs, and, and MAP always as a consequence if APA fails or for strategic reasons is not is not the preferred strategy. Um, and still, one out of the respective or even more maybe fiscal authorities does challenge the setup and the change potentially. So do have a look at whether any existing APAs might be impacted by such a change and um, what to do then to maybe approach the tax authorities or competent authorities um, at an early stage to find a solution and not just sort of give up the IP completely and then be left with double taxation. And for the new setup, think about whether um, a strategy or what strategy would work best for your case um, to avoid double taxation, uh, whether it could be an API, and, and we just learned from Timina, India would be open to that, um, certainly from, for most countries. Um, as a counterpart, would that make sense? Um, would that help you in mitigating potential double taxation risks? So think about that. And then obviously, um, we need a, a, a new TP scheme for the new structure, uh, for the ongoing transactions and going forward. Last but not least, um, we just heard that there is a huge package of grants, subsidies, incentives. So typically, depending on, on the exact nature of that uh, advantage, it may, we may say, and, and just staying with India as an example, we may see a higher profitability resulting partly from those advantages in India then. So, and that is a question to Temina. Uh, we, we all know that for India in particular, in many cases, always depending on fact pattern, obviously, we have a cost plus compensation where, or if we have a cost plus compensation, and local authorities would typically expect quite, quite high um, profit markups from a local perspective. Um, what is your position or your thoughts on what they expect incremental profits caused by grants or similar, would they expect that to stay in India, further increasing the markup, or would they sort of be fine with the usual markups, meaning in the end some of the advantage could end up uh, in, in a different country? So Claudia, this is a very relevant question, particularly for the businesses who are considering to you know, have a manufacturing setup in India. But just to tell you, uh, there is no specific uh, rules or provision related to, you know, this kind of locations, uh, you know, which we call in transfer pricing location savings related uh, rules. Um, but uh, however, uh, initially, uh, you know, this is not the first time some of the um, location specific uh, incentives being offered. Uh, there were uh, initially in service sectors, even some of the manufacturing sectors, there were, uh, you know, few of the benefits were offered. And um, uh, even, um, you know, particularly uh, from the tax authority side, at the low tax level officer, field officer, who actually tried to look at and, uh, you know, where the cost plus markup was used. Or try to increase the markup at the you know the higher percentage uh, in the in the in the uh, you know the face of uh, uh, you know mentioning that there is a location uh, you know the advantages which is available. Uh, hence, the markup should be on a higher side. But uh, this matter actually did not sail through uh, with the various tribunals, and the tribunals uh, which is a quasi court in India. Uh, came out with, uh, uh, you know, on some of the consensus, uh, mentioning that, uh, you know, it is not uh, that, uh, uh, you know, mere presence of a location specific advantage in the market, uh, particularly uh, may, uh, be economically, you know, giving some uh, valuable to m &E because such advantages may be, uh, you know, the commonly available to all others, uh, you know, uh, the participants. And uh, who can simply benefit uh, from this location advantage and without any incurring any co cost. So particularly, um, you know, if uh, the comparables are from the similar uh, locations, if the, you know, the benchmarking have been done appropriately, uh, I don't see that uh, this issue can, uh, you know, the, uh, stay, uh, uh, you know, further. But however, as you said that, you know, AP always helps uh, 
and resolving uh, even uh, such uh, you know such kind of issue uh, in advance uh, so i would uh, uh, encourage that if uh, you know if anybody has uh, the you know this kind of uncertainty then it would be the appropriate uh, mechanism to you know go through it so back to court claudia okay thank you for that and uh, i mean that's certainly good news that we can likely argue uh, it's embedded in into the comparable uh, search result and and even so obviously it may be challenged as always so it might be good to think about strategies to mitigate that risk so with that we'll move on to the next topic which is digitalization as Britta has pointed out already um, we can expect that to, to be fueled I mean even prior to COVID-19 many uh, companies have put on a focus on um, digital service offerings and that that's mainly relating now to digital service offering to customers and clients it's not about improving internal processes by digitalization so we are talking about digital service offerings and in your industry in the manufacturing industry in particular um, we've seen quite some players coming up with uh, completely new service offerings um, most of the time there is a link to their um, existing uh, business like traditional manufacturing business but, but could be completely separate as well um, so let's have a closer look on what that may mean from a transfer pricing perspective I'll not comment it's, it's on the slide on purpose obviously but I'll not comment uh, in length uh, on obviously the pillar one which obviously is something to keep in mind when we talk about digital service offerings um, and and we may or most of us certainly have noticed that the US has just asked to um, for the negotiations to be put on hold due to COVID-19. Um, OECD will um, continue with their work on providing recommendations for definitions and, and exemption rules and stuff like that in July. So uh, maybe a bit of a question mark on whether this will all be finished end of this year or prior to year end as, as intended or whether we have to face a delay here but certainly worthwhile keeping an eye on future developments in that respect so that push on digitalization um, is likely to result in new IP so IP even that is not really built on existing manufacturing IP or similar um, but that that's completely new even so there is that link um, regarding customer base and stuff like that so obviously it does make sense if that's possible to make use of your brand of your reputation of your existing customer base when trying to market uh, new service offerings uh, new digital service offerings um, and that leads to um, the challenge um, to sort of reevaluate um, your old IP even because um, the success that your digital service offering might have, uh, if it's linked and not completely separate from your traditional business, um, it does have an impact on your existing, your old IP. So the relative value of the different pieces of IP um, may change and, and needs to be considered. And, and then obviously, as always, for IP, um, it's crucial on IP allocation to legal entity. So who is the legal owner, who is the economic owner to reflect where is the decision making taking place. And given that quite some of what we already say and expect to see more going forward, um, it is not necessarily the same stakeholders, the same decision makers that have decided over the last years um, or the same sort of position that have decided for decades maybe um, with changing person over your old and traditional IP. It might be different or there might be the opportunity to set it up in a different way because it, even if there is that link, the IP as such is a very different IP from the more traditional one. Um, so that is certainly a crucial question and, and may give some room for um, uh, some, some potential um, and, and of course that needs to be properly reflected in your transfer pricing scheme um, and then going forward you need a, a transfer pricing scheme for the transaction that once established uh, are going on between the IP owners and uh, other um, related business entities 
Uh, and, and again, we have that question in particular if there's some kind of nexus, some link between uh, old and new IP. Do, does that constitute or lead to any IP transfer across border, which would then likely cause tax um, consequences, which, which might be avoided if possible, or at least mitigate the risk might be mitigated. So that's quite some issues you should consider around IP. Um, be, based on that specific, that if you come from a traditional manufacturing business and start into new digital service offerings, with typically that link between both, whether it's customer base or whatever, or brand, um, this does result in some challenges that you, you, don't, you don't have necessarily in each and every IP case in the transfer pricing world. So with that, let's move on to our last, last topic in that webcast. And that is um, cash and liquidity management. And as I, as, as I said, when introducing the three topics, obviously crucial when it comes to survival of a company or a group. And with that, I hand over to Chantal, please. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, let me just take two minutes and bring together some of the things that you've heard in the presentation so far. So, so clearly, it goes without saying that the current crisis is unprecedented. Uh, unlike some of the previous crises, this one started from a health pandemic. And as Britta mentioned earlier on, it has impacted both the supply and the demand side for many companies. This, particularly in the context of industrial products and construction companies, has some unique ramifications. If you really think about your business, there are some aspects of your business that are particularly relevant. The companies in the space are very capital intensive. Many of the business models are ones where they are in a B2B space. So you're selling not to the end customers, but to other businesses. And the contracts that exist in this industry are often somewhat long-term contracts, particularly in the construction space. So as you can imagine, when you have a disruption to your supply network, as I mentioned, these things can last for a few years before you kind of get back to your steady state. So as you're trying to navigate this crisis in these few years, there are going to be clearly reactions to tide over this crisis. Some of the things that Claudia just mentioned was greater move towards digitization. Now remember, there is obviously digitization of your services, but there is a whole lot of internal automation that's happening in the manufacturing space by the use of artificial intelligence or internet of things or digital twin and things like that. And perhaps in this time, when you're really trying to tide over this crisis, there might be greater focus, a substitution from more of the old models to some of the newer forms of internal digitization efforts by either trying to bring your products faster to market or trying to invest in technology and skills that would be more along the lines of predictive analytics that would allow you to sort of provide greater services to your customers. But all of these changes, I think, needs to be looked at through the transfer pricing lens so that you can really identify where the value is getting created and how do you price that value creation. That's kind of happening uh, as a reaction to this thing, but there's also an immediate short-term objective that oftentimes surfaces. And we're sharing this with you based on what we are hearing in the marketplace. When you go to your management and you ask them, what really are the topmost priorities or objectives of the management, we oftentimes hear it's one of the three that you see on the slide. It's either liquidity management, which relates to preserving cash in appropriate locations in the supply network, or having an appropriate second look at your overall uh, cash situation so that your working capital needs across the network is optimized. So there is clearly a much greater focus on this liquidity management aspect in light of this crisis. There's also the second question on cash tax optimization. So your business has suffered this negative shock. There is probably going to be a huge dip in profitability for a short period of time. And in your transfer pricing, you may have pockets where you're paying them cost plus or, or targeted margins. And it's therefore a relevant question to ask, do I continue to pay guaranteed profits and therefore taxes in a situation where my whole business has been impacted in this once in a lifetime situation? What do you do 
with those situations where uh, you might want to recalibrate your transparency. Last but not the least, many clients come to us and say, well, I need to be forward-looking. We know that next year in 2021, we'll be preparing our transfer pricing documentation for this year. Our comparables, they're going to move. You're perhaps, you have to be looking ahead to determine whether you should be static uh, in your transfer pricing or you should be making changes to your transfer pricing so that when it comes time to defend those transfer pricing policies, you have been forward looking and you have a set of benchmarks that you can use to justify your existing results in the transfer pricing framework. So all of these things are immediate conversation topics in some way, shape, or form with your management. And what we want to share with you are some focus areas. Now, not all of them may be relevant to the business that you're in, but some of them are really something that you should start looking at. So in the next slide, present some of these triggers or levers that you can pull. And as you can see, we've kind of listed out seven very broad levers. And we've tried to identify which of these three objectives you might be able to accomplish as you start focusing on these levers, right? So let me just spend a little bit of time going through each of them so that you understand how it might help. So the first one, proactive management of existing transfer pricing policies. This goes to the point of if you have existing targeted margins, be it a cost plus or, or a targeted operating margin, do you have an opportunity to revise those margins given this once in a lifetime impact. I think it is important to understand that there are many countries that are providing legal recourses uh, that you can re rely on from your intercompany contract standpoint that you can utilize to your advantage to say, this is a, an appropriate time for renegotiating my transfer pricing for the short term. Obviously, an important question that comes in is, is going back to what Temina was saying a few uh, minutes ago. Many governments have announced incentives. Sometimes these are cash grants, right? Sometimes these are other forms of subsidies. And when you are doing transfer pricing, you have to ask yourself, how do those grants or subsidies occur in computing the results of your local entities? Do you factor them in and adjust your cost base accordingly, for example? or do you treat them as an extraordinary income or, or a one-time gain and therefore factor that in from a transfer pricing? Obviously, accounting methods are things that you cannot ignore, so you've got to keep that in mind as well. The next one is reassessment of intercompany invoicing terms. This directly goes to a very short-term way of managing your cash flows. Now, as you know, transfer pricing is oftentimes dealt with as an annual result, right? So as long as your entity achieves a certain result at the end of the year, that's what matters from an overall defense and, and you know, tax perspective. So if you have current intercompany invoicing where your group companies are raising an invoice on a monthly basis uh, in adhering to a certain policy, well, maybe you can consider an ad hoc invoicing for a period of time where they're not raising the full invoice for every month. Maybe there is half the invoice, but then towards the end of the year, you figure out what your targeted shortfall is and you true up uh, to, the, to the targeted policy. Uh, and then in the meantime, what you've done is in the, in the short period of time, you've been able to at least manage a little bit of your cash flow needs. We're also seeing a lot of the companies reevaluating their headquarters service cost allocation. Because in these times, there are extraordinary expenses that are being borne by the headquarters. And there are questions as to what do you do with those expenses? Do you remain in the headquarters? Do you kind of pass it on to the network under some economic premise? And, and this is also something that helps in your cash flow optimization, particularly if you're trying to say that, you know, there is good basis, good sound economic basis for all the stakeholders in my business to endure this pain and suffering that the global business is going through. And therefore, you kind of uh, allocate some of these costs on a short-term basis. If you have royalty considerations or if you have royalties that are uh, in your business, you might consider thinking about repaying some of the royalties right, to, to, to help meet your, your objectives. So this is something, obviously, that you need to be very careful about because sometimes, depending on the domestic law, if you prepay too many royalties, then the characterization of the payment might be different. You know, some companies might call it as dividend payments, I mean, so you have to be careful, but we have seen instances when that policy can actually work. Uh, Intercompany financing transactions are clearly an important lever, whether you refinance your debt or you reassess your cash pooling strategies, 
Again, these directly go to the heart of your liquidity management as well as cash tax optimization. Last but not the least, when you have a shock like this, if you are in the IPNC sector, you might have performance guarantees that might be called upon because you're not being able to perform or you're not being able to deliver the, the products as per your schedule dates, and that might trigger performance guarantees that might be in place. And so you need to be carefully monitoring these things so that either performance guarantees or financial guarantees, you know, maybe one of your group companies needs to borrow something and the headquarters need to provide a guarantee in, in, in times of these crises. These are perhaps things that you may not have had to deal with on a regular basis, but in light of this COVID-19 impact, you might suddenly see these, these things come up. Now, not all of them are going to be relevant or as impactful in your business, and there could be a host of other transfer pricing considerations as well, but we just want to present some of these to you so that you could determine what your management's objectives are, and consistent with the objectives, which of these policies might give you the biggest bang for the buck if you're really trying to achieve a short-term recalibration of your policy. So that's what we wanted to share with you. Uh, I think we have a last polling question for which I'm going to turn you back to Claudia. Yeah, thank you, Shanto. Um, that's perfectly right. We have a last polling question for you. And the question is, um, have you adopted or considered adopting any changes to your transport pricing policy in response to the COVID-19 crisis? So this obviously is really a question related to your um, role and, and transfer pricing. Um, and again, just please tick the relevant row and we'll immediately see the results. I'll just allow a little more time for the poll and in the meantime answer one of the questions we have received. The question was um, whether it is has to be expected that on APA procedures, so ongoing procedures, do we expect a delay uh, on the procedure due to COVID-19? Um, well, my, my, my current impression is unfortunately yes. Um, I experience the competent authorities as very, very constructive and very supportive in trying not to put everything on hold. So we do see video conferences rather than physical meetings. Uh, but obviously they have seen, and, and sometimes still do say, constraints uh, on their workforces. Um, some things are easier just to get settled in a physical meeting compared to a video conference. Um, and obviously, this is just about the procedure. The content of the APA may, may have changed too, um, because very rarely we would assume that the um, TPA scheme suggested does fully um, absorb the COVID-19 crisis impact. Uh, so in some cases, that's only not the case. So you, you'll have to deal or you have to think about what to do uh, around the immediate um, consequences of COVID-19. And, and we, we find to date it is best to, as soon as possible, um, approach the relevant competent authorities and discuss with them. And even better if you already have an idea on how that could be factored into your APA um, to ensure that the coverage time-wise and, and scope-wise is as you intended. So yes, I'm afraid we do see some delays, um, but overall I find that the competent authorities are extremely helpful overall um, to help taxpayers through that challenge, additional challenge, uh, if they have an, uh, a procedure going on. So. Um, a few have already made, back to the poll now, a few have already made some important changes, obviously. Um, quite some are considering some, about a fourth, which I think is, is quite impressive. I think uh, now the TPA policy is flexible enough to handle, or maybe they don't see that much of an impact. We don't know, obviously. Uh, and another fourth, uh, roughly, uh, is not, at least to date, hasn't considered any any changes to the TP policies. Um, so thank you so much for um, joining our webcast today. I'll hand over now to Anodri for some closing words. 
Thank you, Claudia. Um, and thank you very much for listening today. And we welcome the opportunity to leverage our transpassing knowledge to your advantages. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact us, especially with your questions. And we hope to see you in one of our next sessions soon again. Stay healthy and goodbye.